Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, I will start and some people might just come. Uh, yeah, so uh, I'm Krzysztof and at the beginning I want to sell, say a word about the institution I'm representing because normally I'm full-time employed at the Department of Philosophy, but we have also this virtual institution called Jagiellonian Center for Law and Philosophy and when the people ask us what it is. It is purely a virtual platform for collaboration between uh, legal philosophers and general philosophers in Krakow. But I think it's quite cool that we have it, so I wanted to boast about it just, <laughs> just at the beginning. So we just run seminars, organize events and so forth. So, so yeah, uh, I think it's nice. And let's get started for today. Yeah, um, uh, yeah. Okay, so uh, let's start with my aim for today. And my aim for today is to provide a, a let's call it a guided tour through philosophy, our theories of uh, institutional belief and institutional intentions. So, uh, why it is important that it's a philosophical theory? Because I'm one of the few people on this event that don't have any legal training. So your way of seeing things as people with legal background might be very much different from my way of looking at things. And uh, I will very much like to hear your feedback. So what do you think about those uh, theories that were Coconuted by crazy philosophers down there. So, as lawyers, you might think that this is plausible, impossible, compatible with your ways of seeing things. So, so uh, my idea is that I will at some point stop and ask you for your reflections on the theories or the arguments that, uh, that I present. So, then it would be very nice if you could spare some time to say what your intuitions and what your gut reactions to some things that certain philosophers have said are. So yeah, so my, my aim is not just to distract you, but to receive a feedback from people which actually have, has a different intuitions having been trained uh, in law. Okay, so that's, uh, that's the aim. And now, um, let me tell you what my plan is for the rest of today and tomorrow morning, if you're there to come. So first I will present some general issues of the problem of intentionality of institutions. And then I will uh, say a bit about the motivation for dealing with this problem. And afterwards I will try to talk you through the most important philosophical theories that has you know, blossomed in the last two decades and especially in the last decade we have like a very much interest in philosophy in this uh, issue of group agency and of specifically institutional intentionality and institutional beliefs. So I would like to hear your uh, opinion on those theories that were recently uh, created by philosophers. Okay, and yeah, so the general questions I will be trying to deal with in this class is how to best think about attributions of beliefs and intentional agency to what I will from now on call institution. And now I will stipulatively define institution for our purposes of the next three hours. So <laughs> what I mean by institution is something different than many people in my institution. And this term is not actually ambiguous in law, social sciences, philosophy, and so on. So I will just make the stipulative definition. For me, institution is a large institutionalized group yeah so often but maybe not necessarily having the status of a legal person 
<laughs> so, and the paradigmatic examples of institutions are uh, corporations, courts of law, and parliaments. That's the three most important examples of uh, institutional agents that are being discussed in the philosophical literature. So, that's that's the target of our inquiry for this class. Okay. Yeah. Um, I might be going too fast, so stop me if I do. Okay, and then uh, we will start with a motivational quote. The quote is from Lish and Petty's books from 2011, which sort of started the resurgence of uh, interest in these philosophical theories. And Lish and Petty go back to Middle Ages, and I guess Biza refers in his book to this very same incident. So, in apparently, 246, Pope Innocent VI was considering whether you can excommunicate a university. And this was, <laughs> so he was wondering whether you can excommunicate Sorbonne, I guess. So <laughs> this was the very problem because Sorbonne was making some sort of heresy and he was wondering whether you can excommunicate Sorbonne. And, but after all, he decided that now we cannot excommunicate Sorbonne because Sorbonne, uh, a corporate person, corporation, because universities were partly political corporations at that time, is not a person. It might be a person, but it's a fictional person. So that was the intuition of the Pope. So he decided against excommunicating a university. But I think that we are more or less in the same position. Maybe we don't want to excommunicate universities, but we sue corporations, we bear parliaments responsible, we talk about such stuff. So yeah, we, we sort of wonder whether corporations, parliaments, and so on are persons, or maybe they are fictional persons, and so on. But I will not talk about persons specifically, but a belief and intention, and why I will tell soon. Okay, so the question is whether we can actually attribute beliefs and intentional actions, so doing stuff for reasons, to such things as corporations, courts, and parliaments. And my observation to start with is that pre-theoretically, we have some sort of conflict of intuitions about it. We, as the folk, are conflicted about whether we treat corporations and parliaments as persons. And there are some intuitions that push us in direction to say, yes, they are. And there are some intuitions that push us in the opposite direction to say, no, they aren't. So this is the uh, thing on the pre theoretical level that we have this conflict of intuitions. And I will talk about three intuitions, two of them which push us in the direction of saying, yes, they are persons, and the one that says, no, they aren't. So the first intuitions, and this is my name, but this is often revoked, this idea is often revoked by only name for our purposes, is the intuition of ubiquity. Because uh, it means that examples of uh, attributing belief and intentions and intentional actions to such entities as corporations, parliaments are called, are ubiquitous in both folk discourse and what is called by Polish lawyers the legal language. And this is a normal thing to do, to attribute beliefs and intentions to those sort of entities. Okay, so let's see how it works. So every paper about this subject examples, and I also had to follow the suit, so, but I have only two examples, but I think they are very nice. So. <laughs> let's see them. First example I found, is on Google website. <laughs> you can check it. <laughs> Opensource.google.com. Google says of itself <laughs> that Google believes that open source is good for everyone. Uh, it's not any sort of official <laughs> of Google that says that open source is good for everyone. It's Google on its website saying open source. Of uh, it, that it believes, not that open source is actually the 
we the, let's say the Google believes that open source of one. So we have an example of corporate entity attributing belief to itself. So we have a, a whole of belief to uh, itself made personally by a corporation. And the other example is that, yeah, I don't know anything about law, but you just open a textbook on any law on a random page and you find statements like this. I barely understand it. I'm not a lawyer, so I don't know what, to, what does it mean actually, but uh, it says something like that. The court presumed that the Congress intends the executive to obey uh, the statute mark commands and expects the courts to grant relief, blah, blah, blah. blah. So we have like a, we are here on like fourth level of meta language <laughs> because there is attribution, there is an attribution of an intentional state presumption, which is a form of believing to the court. And this content of this court beliefs is that is not something about the world, it's about the intentions of the Congress, which is another institution. And the content of the intention of the Congress is still what some other institutions should do, and so on and so forth. So you have like uh, this, and this is like millions of these examples in legal literature. So you have attributions of either intentional states like beliefs, presumptions, intentions, or intentional agency to sort of entities like this. So, and this is, you know, normal, no one cares, you know, this is not for philosophers, this is for admitted, admitted administrative lawyers, you know, and administrative lawyers read this book and yeah, <laughs> true, <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Uncontestable true of that the Congress, the court presumed that Congress intends and so on and so forth. So you have loads of such examples. But the examples don't make an argument. We need to go somewhere farther to make an argument of the example from the examples. So what is the argument that is used, uh, so which is produced by using such examples? And the sort of argument that lies beyond invoking those examples is that, yeah, so we have lots of commonly accepted statements. The statement that all reasonable people think to be true. And now we are the philosophers and we have a job to do. And what is our job to do as metaphysicians uh, is to find something that corresponds to true statements namely the truth makers of this of this statement so uh, the job of metaphysics is to say what makes certain statement that we find uncontroversially true true so there must be something in the world that was the argument that makes these attributions of beliefs and international agency to such entities as corporation court arguments and so on and so forth true those might be very different things, that might be things that we won't normally expect there to be, but there must be something true. So this is the first uh, sort of intuition and the argument that is produced by the intuition. So uh, since you're not philosophers, maybe I, I wonder if you would want to say something about this truth-making argument, whether you find it at least slightly plausible that we need to find something that makes such statements true. So I think it's an important way of <laughs> arguing, but I'm not sure whether it's correct way of arguing. I'm not a philosopher, so may I have a Yeah, yeah, I, I'm especially interested in not a philosopher. <laughs> if you accept something like the error of theory, and yeah, so that all that is just simply false, Okay, yeah, so uh, error theory is always on the table, but uh, error theory should be somehow motivated. So uh, the philosophers, though, the usual strategy of analytical philosopher 
nowadays is that we don't try to argue against people finds true unless we have very, very good reasons to postulate error theory. So in ethics, people argue for error theory because they say, yeah, well, we have people say that moral statements are true, but we have very, very strong theoretical reasons to say that not true. So the first uh, first you know reaction of philosophers should be to say what people believe to be true is true unless we have strong reasons to say it's false. But do we have a strong reason to say that it is false what is said in administrative law textbooks? That's <laughs> maybe we can't work we do, but we <laughs> we need to produce this argument. What is wrong? In this, yeah, so we will have some uh, arguments, but yeah, uh, but we the, the the initial reaction of a philosopher is yeah, when, when people say that something is true, it, it is true unless we have reason to say it's not. So, so that's that's the way of arguing. Anyone else wants to share? Not necessarily, so okay, so yeah, let's go. Then goes the more elaborate argument which again relies on intuitions which is for uh, believing that corporation and so on uh, has beliefs which is the so-called argument for response from responsibility so if we want to attribute genuine responsibility to institutions and it seems that lots of people want to do so yeah I, I could approach a, a question concerning the former slide. Yeah, no, well, yeah, sure, sure, sure. Slides with, with Google, uh, we believe in something. Uh, I think that maybe it's the same problem with generally we person. So why, I don't know, we person as we believe in something uh, yeah. is not problematic or was yeah. becoming interesting. Yeah. But that Google believes that all the sources yeah. exist for everyone is Okay, so I will uh, I will talk about it later. But, <laughs> yeah, but I think this there is an important difference uh, between saying that we so, say me and you <laughs> believe together that something is true, and saying uh, that Google believes it, which stems precisely from the fact that Google is an institutionalized agent. So it's not uh, Brian and Larry, <laughs> there are those guys who founded Google. Google nowadays is not Brian and Larry. This is something more, this is like something which is somehow institutionalized. And I will try to say something how from yeah, I thought one may say that, okay, so we can translate we believe in something, we believe in something in general sense that the executive committee of yeah. Google or, or all the uh, persons that work in Google. Yeah, so that's that would be one of the first theories I will talk about and then we will discuss it more. But yeah, you're on the right track, so you, but you are doing something which, I, which a true philosopher would do. You, started to look for a truth maker <laughs> yeah so we said google believes yeah no no there are a couple of guys and they say we believe and that's that's what what is actually being uh, done here so yeah that's that's one way of looking at the truth maker of this sort of pronouncement to say yeah that's we believe that and that's that's a legitimate theory but uh, i would like us to wonder whether it's a uh, best theory or something you know and there are several yeah but but it's not so sorry people have already invented it and then criticized it so we will go through arguments for and against this theory yeah. okay and then yeah so many people say that it's reasonable to attribute responsibility to such agents as parliaments courts and corporations and we might wish to say that we uh, hold the constitutional tribunal for the responsible for you know making people miserable by saying that this statue is invalid or something or something else. and the common line of thought is that 
we can only have anything responsible if we treat it as agent which is capable of intentional action yeah so in animate objects objects that are not capable of intentional actions cannot really be responsible for anything so uh intentional action is precondition of responsibility and this is a philosophical theory which claims of itself as being just common sense that, you know, that it's common sense codified by philosophers to say that only intentional agents are responsible for stuff. Okay, so let's elaborate on this uh, 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 argument. So, uh, the philosophers who deal with action and responsibility often argue like this. Uh, intentional actions as it seemed to act intentionally, to do something on purpose. And this is one of the most basic notions in philosophy. Yeah, so when do stuff, things act on purpose? And this is very important for people to distinguish the situation when people act for pur purpose from those situations when people don't act on purpose. If you have a six-year-old kid, you will know that this is most important Think in life to know whether my friend acted on purpose when he hit me or not. <laughs> that's that's really really important to know when stuff act on purpose. So intentional action acting on purpose <laughs> seem to, according to many philosophers, require the ability to act for reasons. Only those entities that can act for reasons can really be said to act intentionally, to act on purpose. But to act for reasons require having reasons, requires the ability to possess those mental states we call reasons for action. So there is this intimate conceptual link between the con uh, concept of intentional action acting on purpose and the concept of reason and the concept of having reasons. And then the standard uh, philosophical story about this says that, yeah, but reasons, which are something that guide our action, re having reasons require having more basic mental states, which are beliefs and desires. So these are the most two basic types of mental, among one, uh, among the most basic types of mental states we find beliefs and desires and having such mental states as beliefs and desires is a precondition of having reasons and having reasons is precondition of being capable of uh, intentional action and being capable of intentional action is a precondition of being responsible for anything one does. So if corporations are responsible then, through this argument that, for example, Liszt and Petit use, we go to the conclusion that, yeah, corporations have beliefs because they are responsible. That's like nearly analytic entailment. All right. Uh, yeah, and uh, why does it sound? This is not something that was invented 10 years ago. This is something that Anselm attributed the Aristotle, the classical analysis of intentional agency, which Anscombe attributed to Aristotle, is that to have an intention to do A, to want to do A, you must have, maybe this is not sufficient condition, but it's a necessary condition, that if you want to do A, you must have a desire to achieve B, and have a belief that by doing A, you will achieve B. So you need those two kinds of mental states. You have, need to have this, what is called cognitive state, the motivational state, and you need to have this cognitive state. And only those two states together allow you to have an intentional, intention to do an action. And this is called the practical service by Armstrong. And this is the, according to Armstrong, what Aristotle identified as basic form of 
intentional explanation. So if you want to, if I want to, you to you did A intentionally, I must say, yeah, you wanted to achieve something and you thought that by doing this, you will achieve this something. There are some cases when you just do what you want and then A can be B. This can be the same thing, <laughs> but they can be different. Yeah, so, is that? But you also need to decide to do it. So. Yeah, so, so this might be not sufficient. Okay. So some people, you need to have some extra condition. Intention is not just belief plus desire, but belief plus desire plus something. Okay. Like the act of decision. So Michael Bratman, I believe, says you need to have a plan on top of that and so on. But this is like minimal condition. It's not sufficient. But for according to something, it is sufficient according to something to someone else, that's debatable, but it's nearly universally accepted that this is a necessary condition. Okay, and then, uh, yeah, so that's the other uh, intuition that gets us to the tentative conclusion that, yeah, uh, Corporations have beliefs and desires. Courts have beliefs and desires because they are responsible for stuff. We will keep it. Yeah. Yeah, I have you know, a little bit of a problem with that intuition because I wonder what kind of responsibility do we talk about. For example, if we take criminal responsibility, I believe that the commonly shared intuition is that the uh, corporations cannot be held criminally responsible. Uh, we, we even have some kind of statute that uh, provides some kind of criminal responsibility for corporate uh, stuff, but it's still dependent on whether a physical person committed the crime and it's just like... Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. And we can have a strict liability. That means that yeah. liability is not dependent on anybody's weak desire yeah, yeah, yeah. and so on. Yeah, okay, so, uh, okay, so there are two issues here. So what Maciek has said is that, okay, so in order to have a corporation being responsible, it must have been the case that some actual person did something. And I guess no one really denies this. <laughs> the question is how are those uh, facts related that some actual person like the CEO of the, uh, you know, reporting, it's called reporting judge? The, judge who reads off the verdict, <laughs> read the verdict. Uh, it must, it's a necessary condition for court to do something, but the question that philosophers would like now to ask is what's the relation between those two? It's the um, identical fact or non-identical fact, and that's what we are dealing with uh, in a second. So, but the question is that, yeah, but even though it's, even if we reduce the agency of court to agency of judges, then it's because it's still true that uh, uh, courts decide, but it's just reducible to some further fact. So, uh, well, yes, President would say that it's just sure imputation. Okay, and that's uh, yet another theory. So, so, yeah, so we will discuss this both theories that metaphor view and reductive view in a second, yeah, but. It, this the, the, the fact that it might be reduced for doesn't change the fact that it's true that courts decide and are responsible. But the question will then be what, if, whether it's true that it's resp uh, 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 responsible. And so, Professor, you asked questions? No, no, no. no. Okay. Uh, so, maybe a yeah. follow up? Yes. It's really interesting for that case, I believe. And it concerns Google. I believe there was a trial. Google was a trial for this uh, a street view thing because yes. these street view cameras uh, accumulated a lot of additional data yeah. on, uh, instead of only making photos. And Google defended itself uh, for the court, saying that it, it was only one one programmer, one coder that uh, <laughs> did that. So they like deferred their responsibility. Yeah. From a corporate yeah. and, uh, and, and the yeah. one person. Yeah, yeah, that's true. So, so yeah, we will. So that's we are going somewhat to in the vicinity of our main problem. In fact, we just what's the relation between the uh, individual actors 
and the corporate actors. But this is not only possibility. So I just ask the uh, question in abstract, but then we will talk about this possibility of reduction. Okay. And then on the other side, we have this, what I call intuition of incredulity. It's like, this is a very strong intuition. No. <laughs> no, no, no. Stop it, you know. <laughs> this is crazy, you know. It, it's a, like in Monty Python, there was this moment when John Cleese came and said, no, stop, this job is stupid, end of it, you know. <laughs> so this is something like, uh, like this in philosophy. So many people say, yeah, and sort of, we're doing something when we attribute responsibilities, beliefs, and intentions to the sort of agents like corporation corporates. No, 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 no. <laughs> it cannot be the case that there are genuine beliefs of corporation and corporates. This is just plainly false. You know, this common sense tells us very strongly that we cannot believe this. So yeah, this is this also very strong intuition that we have. So we do attribute them intentions, responsibilities, and beliefs. But on the other hand, we say, but that it cannot be real or believers. It, it cannot be just simply true that there is this sort of uh, non-person can be really a believer and subject of intentional action. And why? We have this very strong intuition, and that's sort of my speculation on why we have this intuition that it's just crazy to say corporations have beliefs. Uh, my uh, hunch is that belief is something, this is a mental state, uh, and philosophers of mind say that the normal definition of belief, that belief is a mental state we have two main features. Uh, beliefs are, are mental state we have semantic contents. They express propositions which can be assessed as being true or false. So they're vehicles of thought, you know, beliefs. When we believe something, we believe something true or we believe something false. So beliefs are mental states which have a genuine semantic content. They express propositions. They end the logical relation and so on and so forth. And on the other hand, beliefs are such mental states that enter causal relations because they produce intentional actions together with desires. So beliefs are those very special mental states that have these two very interesting features. And to say of a, a non-person, non-human being, Maybe chimpanzees have beliefs, perhaps, yeah. Maybe, uh, you know, etiologists say that chimpanzees and whales have beliefs, but most non persons, we don't really suppose that they are capable of having beliefs. Yes, and especially non individual entities. We really don't suspect them to be capable of having such an elaborate and complex mental life as to include states such as beliefs or desires. So this is the, what I think uh, drive the intuition of credibility that we cannot really force ourselves to believe that there are some extra entities, some fun individual entities like corporation and parliaments, which also are capable of having genuine mentality, genuine belief and so such state. This just sounds crazy. <laughs> but we general philosophers are not afraid of crazy. <laughs> this is this is what we do for living. We do crazy stuff for living. So we step on the by the edge and then move forward, you know, in our thinking. So so we, we will think whether we can or cannot really think in this way. But but this is also I think important intuition. Okay, so that was just my, my trying to uh, wake up the intuitions in you. I haven't really spoken of any theory, but you did. Uh, but uh, now a few words 
about why this might or might not be important to think about the interpersonal uh, institutional intentions and beliefs. So there is this common perception, and I don't know if it's true, uh, and maybe uh, maybe you can correct me that there is this perception among non-lawyers that current legal system proliferate rights and duties of corporations. I don't really, I cannot really assess this uh, statement, but this is a perception among non-lawyers that uh, there is something fishy going on in current legal systems. The current legal systems allow too much uh, for corporations, that there is too much protection of corporate rights and too much, you know, uh, shielding of responsibility by a corporate activity and so on and so forth. This might be just mistaken, the folk may be mistaken about the way the civil law or uh, law of, of corporation works, but this is something that I think is, is a social fact. People think that the law starts to increase the legal uh, standing of corporate entities. So this is uh, this is one way that one reason that people wish to think about want to think about this issue that this is something that's happening within the law and maybe it's a bad thing that it's happening within the law. But this was this case in the U.S., which was highly technical. It was about co corporate limit, limits of giving money to uh, electoral campaigns, and it was then ruled by the Supreme Court that the, there cannot be such limits because it would infringe free, free speech right of corporation. And then all the call in the popular press broke loose that, oh my God, how can the court claim that corporation has a right of free, to free speech and so on and so forth. It was, uh, it might be just folk perception, but there's this folk perception that the <coughs> law starts to work, work uh, in this way. And another reason I think might be important for lawyers and legal philosophers is the issue of legislative intention. So this was something that Stephen Neal talked in his uh, uh, talk, that if you are an intentionalist about uh, content of law, then you want to uh, attribute intentions to legislative bodies. So you treat uh, parliaments and other legislative bodies as capable of having intentions. And then Neil used precisely this analogy to corporate agencies. He said that, yes, yeah, some textualist wants to deny that uh, corporate, uh, that parliaments can have genuine intentions, but yeah, we, we do attribute intentions to Apple, so what's the problem with attributing intentions to uh, 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 the US Congress, but yeah, maybe there is a problem with attributing intention to Apple, and then we will have the same problem with attributing intention to uh, US, US Congress. So uh, I think, yeah, so if you want to, I think maybe if you want to defend some form of intentionality about uh, uh, the legislative intention and the content of law, you might want to have some theory about what does it mean to, uh, to say that the Congress intended something or the Congress made, meant something by a specific statute or something. That, uh, that might be interesting for a you know, legal theory point of view. And for us, the crazy people in general philosophy departments, the reason to be interested in this issue is very different because for us, the reason to uh, uh, be interested in corporate minds, corporate beliefs is that this is one of the central questions of philosophy of mind since ever. It's the question of what entities in the world have genuine minds. And in contemporary debate, this is the question of first, whether non-human animals can possess genuine mental states, and if so, which? 
and uh, give a fun story. Eric Sweetgabo, who is one of the leading philosophers of my country, ran a survey about uh, among general philosophers and asked them about their intuitions about the minds of garden snails. So, do you how many of you think that garden snails have minds? <laughs> yeah, not so many, but how many of you think that frogs have minds? <laughs> and whales? <laughs> yeah, so, so, so you see, we have some sort of a mixed intuitions about uh, animal minds. We tend to, dis most of us tend to dismiss garden snakes. Most of us tend to think, yeah, whales are definitely minded. Uh, we are, frogs are somewhere in between, and this is something we don't really have a you know, principal answer to. Which animals, because we are not Cartesians any longer, we say that not human animals have minds, but which animals? What is the principle for determining the boundary between the minded non human animals and the non minded non human animals? So this is one of the most important questions of the uh, general philosophy of mind. And the other context in which this question arises is obviously the so-called strong AI hypothesis. Uh, so the strong AI hypothesis said that it's in principle possible to have uh, an artificial system which would have mental state exactly the same kind as we do have. This is uh, the strong AI hypothesis. Because weak AI hypothesis is just empirically true. There are artificial systems which are capable of performing cognitive operations. They add and so on and so forth. But whether uh, there will be uh, artificial systems that are capable of having exactly the same kind of mental state that we do have, it's one of the most important questions in the uh, philosophy of uh, of mind. So this is like parallel debate. And then we get this other issue. Yeah, so we have problem with animals. We have problems with computers and robots. And then there is this strange thing of those institutional entities, of which we also sometimes say that they do have mental states. So is it true that they do have mental states? So this is another question of where is the boundary of the mind? what is really minded and what is not really minded. So this is, this is what motivates people to have, uh, have the debate. All right, so I'm going really fast. So I will start to ask you questions soon because I don't want to run out of stuff too quickly. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so I will, and now move to theories, and we will talk about the relative strength and weaknesses of the theory. So, maybe it would be good to do two or three theories today, and the rest be for tomorrow, because the three uh, the last ones are really difficult, and the two first are really simple. And yeah, so my plan for today, for today and tomorrow, is to run through those six major theories about what does it mean to attribute uh, intentions and beliefs to uh, corporations and governments and so on. And I will say now something about those two theories. The first and the second are dead. They're very simple, <laughs> but they're dead. No one really <laughs> holds them any longer. They, We'll go through them just for instructive purposes to understand what went wrong. Uh, then we have three and four, which are some, somehow the strongest competitors on the market, the most popular accounts. Uh, they're somewhat, they're very strongly opposite each other. And I will try to explain why they are very different from each other. And I will try to talk with you about whether you find any of them plausible or what other good sides, bad sides, and so on. And then if we have enough time, I will want to talk to you about two last theories, which are sort of 
less popular, but I think they're very interesting. Uh, and I think that they show us some important things about the, uh, uh, the statements, this attribution of beliefs to intentional, uh, institutional agents. So, yeah, I hope we will have time for all of them because I'm doing this super quick. Yeah, so, sorry, uh, it's summer. Uh, and, but yeah, so we try to do them all, I hope. Yeah, so first two, which we'll cover today, maybe three, but first two are that. This is just instruction. No one believes it. Bear with me. <laughs> uh, but this is something we need to go through because nearly all papers today which deal with the subject go with, yeah, there were this metaphor approach and summative approach, they are false. We need to say, <laughs> come up with something new. So this is the usual way we introduce those, uh, those uh, issues. So let's get started. So metaphor approach. Uh, and philosophers usually quote Clinton, but I think that there were loads and lots of legal theorists who uh, had this view, but I'm too afraid to quote any legal theorists in this room because you know all them too well. <laughs> but you may tell me which legal theorists actually hold this view, and then maybe I will have some nice thoughts. So I think as Vina, when you in your book you say that legalists, that nothing the philosopher who who nothing classified as legalists about the person who would be perhaps the people who say that they have this view. Not necessarily because it, it might not be into it depends on what you mean by a fiction. So fiction can mean either like a just legal creation. Yeah. Of course in that sense, yes. But fiction can also mean like something not true. Okay. Uh, but would be sort of somehow pretend to be true. Yeah. That's a, that's different. But okay. I mean, yeah, so I mean the second thing. So I, I need someone <laughs> I need a lawyer who said the second thing, that it's literally not true. <laughs> they need to go to Sabini. Yeah. Because, yeah? Okay. So, yes. From Sabini. Yes. Okay. So, the metaphor view says something like this. Yeah, we do attribute beliefs and intentions of institutional entities, but those statements in, in which we do are not literally true. They're at best and this tools as some sort of metaphors. Yeah, we use them purely metaphorically. We, we say uh, that Google believes something, but this is just a metaphor for something else. And something else may mean that the board believes so and so on and so forth. But the very statement about the uh, attribute uh, which, in which we use the phrase institution X believes that P is never literally true. That's the metaphor view. And yeah, so that's the metaphor view. And to slow down with my speaking, because I'm going hopefully fast, I now open the floor to hear your. <laughs> so, how do you find the metaphor view? So, do you think it's something worth defending? If there, has it any merits? Or not? Is that? Well, I guess it's sort of metaphysically parsing all this. Yeah. There's a lot of entities around floating around. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's that's one of the main attractions. There is no metaphysics involved. In order to attribute certain values that institution, you must have a goal. Assuming I'm president of Google and express certain opinions. So this opinion will be deemed or taken to be opinion of belief of Google because there's a rule saying that whatever the president of Google says uh, counts as the opinion of Google. Okay. So that is that without the rules, there would be no such effect. And that is what Kelsen had in mind yeah. when he was talking about Zurecht, imputation. Okay, but uh, so I have never read Kelsen, <laughs> so I'm pressing on Kelsen. But would Kelsen say that this statement is true then? Yeah, because okay. well, generally, you know, that's pretty complicated. That you take into account that was, a, that, that was the beginning of 20th century. So, <laughs> so Kelsen said that there's a you know, Zion Solen. Uh, so the, uh, the 
what is and what ought to be. And if we are in the sign, then the, the principle that organizes that what is, is causality. Okay. There is a causal link between cause and effect. And then we have this uh, sphere of the soul. And here we have the piece of imputation. That means that if I do that, it is <laughs> certain legal effect is imputed, okay. is su zugerechnet. Uh, the, the, I count as uh, having yeah. caused this effect, but of course it's not causality in the, the, the okay. sense of natural world. Okay, yeah. so I think this. That's the nice starting point for our discussion because this will can come back at a later point. So uh, let's uh, say I say institution X believes that B. Okay. So the metaphor view actually can have two readings, and I think we can go. Uh, slightly analytically on this. So the first and most uh, brutal reading of the uh, metaphor view would be to say that this statement, calls it the I statement, it, it will say like I statement is not true. It is a metaphor. Yeah, that would be the brutal reading of the metaphor view. So I, I'm wondering whether any legal theorist used this brutal reading. So this is I statement. I statement is the statement institution X believes that P. Just, let's call this whole statement I statement, institutional statement. Yeah, and the brutal reading of the metaphor view would be. I statement is not true, it's just a metaphor. That's the brutal reading of the metaphor view. But what you're saying of Kelsen, I'm trying to guess <laughs> what Kelsen might have meant, but not, not reading Kelsen ever, <laughs> would be to say that, okay, but we can have a different version of metaphor view, which would say something like that. This I statement is true or can be true. But the word believe has non standard meaning in the sentence. So you said something that causes in law means something different, that it has different metaphorical meaning. The belief of Mr. X is deemed to be the belief of the institution. Yeah. Uh, so there would be like subtle version of metaphor view. Maybe it's more reasonable, and maybe philosophers didn't really think through, and legal theorists have already solved the problem by <laughs> this Kelsenian <laughs> way of. Let us say that that what Kelsen claims uh, uh, that that's a metaphor. For okay. Kelsen, it's certainly not a metaphor. He just said that two areas that are two different skills, uh, sign and solid. And okay. he's interested in solid only. He says sign is organized. Okay. Uh, in accordance with causality principle, solid is organized in accordance with subject. Okay, so, so, so this would be the, then it would be a non metaphor view and maybe a view that no philosopher has taken into account. But so, so it's interesting. So that it would be mean something like that. But I statement is true. But uh, believe as special legal meaning. Not necessarily. I would say that that's a true competition. And this and this statement. On this statement. Yeah. yeah. Truth comes from the following. There is an individual, yeah. physical person. Yeah. Uh, and there's a rule attributing mental states of such physical persons to their corporation. 
So okay. there are proof conditions of this. Uh, uh, of this thing. Yeah, so this has, uh, so yeah, the, so this was something that would, is close to several of the other theories, but then it uh, has, my, we might read Kelsen as saying something that in such context belief has some special meaning, but this special meaning has its own truth conditions. Yeah. Visa? Yeah, I just think that, uh, the we see the Kelsen maybe some other legal theories, like whole Kelsen, so maybe there we could go like I said, Shorthand approach. Okay, so yeah, so this is very different. Okay, so shorthand. <laughs> so uh, yeah, so this will be my rant about philosophy, general metaphysics. <laughs> so be ready, buckle up, go for <laughs> coffee, get back in 15 minutes. So uh, outside of general metaphysics, people always confuse skepticism and reductionism, <laughs> but these are very, very different things. To say that uh, X does not exist and to say X is just Y. <laughs> They're like two extremely different things. So the metaphor view says institutional beliefs don't really exist. This is just metaphor. Uh, this account will be just reduction. And so I don't know whether Kelsen is at the end of the day the proponent of metaphor view or the reduction view. So saying we can either say that institutional beliefs do not exist, or just say institutional beliefs exist, but there, there's something else. So this is like in the philosophy of mind, really important. So you can say either that. Minds don't exist. Some people say that, I say that. Uh, <laughs> don't worry about it <laughs> for the moment. So there are people called like eliminativists and they say that there's just no mentality, it's an illusion. And there are much more sober people and popular people called cognitive scientists who would say, yeah, minds exist, but they're just brains. <laughs> and this is two very different things to say minds don't exist and to say minds exist, but minds are just reducible to brains. And in this context, the same distinction operates. Whether we want to say, no, there are no institutional beliefs, or whether we want to say, no, there are institutional beliefs, but they are just beliefs of officials, members, and so on and so on. Uh, so, uh, was Perfect, not reduction. Mister, he was strongly believed that solid cannot be reduced okay. to less than. I would say this is just why, provided that there exists a rule okay. attributing mental states of, it, of an individual to a corporation. Okay, but yeah, so this is a special form of reduction. Is that yeah. reductions to rules? Yeah. Okay. So yeah. So, 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 so this is not yeah. so this is not a metaphor, but yeah. Like maybe I will add, I, I anticipate the, the second account, but mm -hmm. we concentrate on the metaphorical non-standard use of belief, but we can also say that the very term institution X is a metaphor. Yeah. Yeah. We, and yeah, yeah. Then we, yeah. I think we have that in the second account. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So both are in some sense metaphor. Yeah, yeah. you can say that. Okay, Tomas. Uh, so what? So sorry, that's when we began getting into the semantic pragmatic distinction. But yeah. one argument like when I face against a metaphor view is that a lot of metaphor. Many people believe that metaphors have this property that they can die and yeah. or get conventionalized. So yeah. the argument here would be uh, we've been talking like it's not that we invented this way of talking five years ago. It's been around for like one hundred years. So it might have originated as a metaphor, but it no longer is because we've been using this. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's that's very good. Very nice. Yeah. Okay. And the other voices on the metaphor view? No. Okay, so let's move on. And yeah, so uh, what are the uh, pros usually in the literature? So first what Pizza said, there is no strange metaphysics, we don't have any metaphysical problems. Uh, second is that if you are in general some sort of fictionalist about law, <laughs> and many people can be, then you will be happy to accept this view. Uh, but that's a very short list of 
<laughs> of uh, advantages and the main disadvantages, disadvantage, which, for example, Tolev said in this paper I sent you, which you probably didn't read, and I don't blame you, but <laughs> just say that I didn't invent this argument. Tolev says uh, just rejects the metaphor view, saying, yeah, but we can't, we cannot accept the metaphor view because if we say that if that institutional intentions are metaphors, then we say that institutional responsibility is a metaphor, and that we really don't want to do. And yeah, so so I am very happy to hear your voice about this dollar and counter argument, whether it's self and work. Yeah, I, so I think there might be important distinctions between corporations and, and legislatures. Okay. Here. Corporations, for a purpose of legal analysis, we actually need kind of belief desire attributions in order to apply legal doctrine to them. Legislatures, it depends on the theory of interpretation involved, but on some of them, you sort of treat them like a black box mm -hmm. and they produce an output, which is the legislative the, the text. And it seems to me that you need legislative intentions in order to interpret the text because many of the standard moves make no sense unless you're assuming an author. Mm -hmm. But there's a sense in which you don't care about the actual author on some of the theories and you sort of are constructing an author with intentions when you interpret the text. But if someone comes in and says, oh no, the legislators all um, were paying no attention to what they were voting on and they didn't, strictly speaking, intend anything because they didn't read the, the, the statute, um, you'd sort of say, well, it doesn't matter. They, they followed the correct yeah. procedure. And, and when I say intention, I mean what a reasonable person would infer about the author. Yeah. So, so I wonder if, mm -hmm. if you're looking at legislative intent, this looks like okay. something in the neighborhood of a plausible contender, whereas on the corporate side, it looks like it's dead in the water. Okay, so that, that's an interesting thought, and I think that philosophers didn't really think about it. And, <laughs> and that's might be that in, uh, in the context of legislative intention, the metaphor you might have very, a stronger claim to plausibility. Yeah, well, I, mean, I don't like the metaphor formulation. Okay. I, it's, it's fictionalist or something. Fictionalist, yeah. But, okay. Yeah, so, fi so the fictions are really important, but yeah. it's not exactly a metaphor. Okay, yeah. Okay, so I will. Really, Hopefully, talk about fictionalism at the very end. So, but yeah. So, so then, uh, I think it's important that there might be a distinction between different kinds of institution. What which theory is best for for each case? So, we might not have a uniform theory. And philosophers, unfortunately, want uniform theories. <laughs> so, so that's that might be the problem that we want to have theory both for corporations and parliaments and. We can find one. Yeah, okay. yeah. And for, for what it's worth, there's a long list of people who just deny that legislators, yeah. legisla legislatures have intentions in the relevant sense, even though people speak loosely. Yeah, Max okay. Braden, the sort of American legal realist, Ronald Wharton. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so some yeah. of these people are maybe not thinking very hard about kind of the downstream implications of what they're claiming, but, but yeah, there's a lot of this in print if you're looking for places to. Yeah, okay, that's that's good. That's good. That's really helpful. I think, yeah, I, I think I came with another form of the metaphor approach. Just my wondering what kind of metaphor it is, because as I understood, metaphors are like comparing two different yeah. objects and saying that have different ontological structure, uh, but that are of different yeah, ontological status, but it helps us to understand. Yeah. one object via the other. Yeah, and true. here, if we try to understand institutional belief via normal belief, we like try to put some new properties that it may, may give us. And if we just came to, to, to a conclusion that, well, institutional belief is totally like the normal belief, traditional, so what's what's the help of using a metaphor? Okay, yeah, so so I think, yeah, I think that's, that's an important point as well. So, Metaphor might be something like a cognitive prop in, in your account. Yeah, so we, we don't really understand what corporations do. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> corporations are hard to understand. So we have used this prop, this cognitive prop, and say, yeah, they're somehow like people. And that we simplify the regular reality by saying, so the corporations believed and intended 
and that uh, that really helps us understand the legal reality. So I, yeah, maybe that's 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 a really nice redunder in favor of the metaphor view. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I think that's rather a problem of the metaphor view because we, well, if we compare something. For example, I don't know, we can call uh, one speaker is white, the other is the speaker is black because we have a part of our speakers, let's say. And we, oh, there, there are two speakers, but only the white speaker is the true speaker, and we just compare it to the, and they do everything the same, but only the color remains the other. So, so I don't see where this metaphor goes exactly, because, well, the essence of metaphor is, in fact, an analogy. So yeah, okay. what we are gaining by comparing the institutional belief uh, and the classical belief. Yeah. I don't think we're gaining anything because they're so similar. The metaphor must break somewhere. This ontological differences must be somehow uh, relevant to our um, discussion. And I don't think that they are. Okay. So you wouldn't at the end of the day defend the metaphor view. Yeah. Okay. Because it, uh, <laughs> I, I think yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. it's just the question the question of mechanics. That's just like yeah. does not help with anything. Oh, okay, great. Tash. What Matt just said made me wonder because like another notion similar to metaphor but which does not suffer from certain deficiencies would be metonymy, which uh, assumes some sort of tighter relation between like the and object of the other, and uh, I was wondering uh, what if anyone has defended no, the no, 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 you're free to, <laughs> right? <laughs> okay, so let's uh, let's move on. Uh, okay, and the second dead in the water approach, but we need to go through in order to get the, the more popular one, is what is now called the simple su summative approach. And the simple summative approach says something like that, to say that a group believes that P is to say that all the members of this group believes that P, believe that P. And this is someone, something no one believes. So I'm really <laughs> uh, happy to hear what you think of it and whether you find any attraction in this, uh, in this simple summative view or, or no. No, no okay so yeah so the good thing only good thing about the simple somatic view is that it offers an easy reduction of the uh, I, I statements to some other statement it allows us to reduce attributions of beliefs to groups to attribution of beliefs to individual but that's the end <laughs> of its attraction the problem is that it's open to yeah, is that go on. Yeah, I was just thinking that it seems to me that sometimes when we when I say something like that, um, the summer school participants like my lecture. Yeah. So <laughs> but we are not an institution. <laughs> okay. Oh, well, yeah, yeah. So, so there are like uh, group statements that have the simple distributive reading. Right. So like or uh, philosopher dislike cultural theorists mm -hmm. <laughs> and it might be the case that the best reading of mm -hmm. philosopher dislike cultural theorists is to say that all philosophers mm -hmm. right. yeah and in some context to say uh, to, to use the plural subjects just mean mm -hmm. the you know that simple distributive reading but when this theory phase it faced in case of institutionalized groups Okay. So, so yeah, like Finns uh, are proud of their country, are they? <laughs> you, how do you know? You make you, you conduct a poll and you find out. Yeah. So, so this is uh, this this summative approach, distributive reading is fair, but it does not apply to institutionalized groups. That's that's the claim. Sometimes it's perfectly fine. Yeah. Okay. So there is a whole lot of standard counter examples to the uh, simple somatic approach and the counter example I like the most and you will be forced to hear it now because I like it the most is the Supreme Court going on a fishing trip counter example. I really love this example. Uh, so there's a, a story about all whole 
all the members of the fishing trip uh, of the Supreme Court of some country, let's say Czech Republic, <laughs> going <laughs> on a fishing trip together and they fish in the lake and get really, really drunk. And after they get really, really drunk, they start to talk politics and they are like, yeah, yeah, I think abortion ban is in unconstitutional. Yeah, you're right, <laughs> abortion ban. And everyone agrees on that and expresses their sincere belief that abortion ban is unconstitutional. So all the members of the Supreme Court express their belief that abortion ban is unconstitutional. Can we say that the Supreme Court believes that abortion ban is unconstitutional? No. No. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> For many reasons. One of them is that there was no proper procedure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there was no proper procedure. Okay. Uh, I would also say that while all members of the Supreme Court seem to at that point believe that it is unconstitutional, the Supreme Court, the institution of Supreme Court, is not even really present there. Okay. Yeah. That's important metaphysical observation. And this uh, will bring us to very important issues about what is exactly the Supreme Court. Is Supreme Court just all the members of Supreme Court? Because if the sum simple somatic approach is false, then it means that the Supreme Court is not just a uh, sum of its members. But, uh, but I think I can say also for the press release or something that like that, the Supreme Court believes that abortion is unconstitutional. Nevertheless, they, I don't know, overrule something or, or, or something like that. Like going into the minds of, of those courts or how they, I, I don't know, what they believe in, uh, in, in their, I don't know, papers, etc. So they had some other motivations, but they believe that, that, uh, that it's unconstitutional. Okay. Could you really do that? I, I'm wondering, uh, this is a genuine question. If, would we really use the phrase that the Supreme Court believes that in such a press release? Would, would it be considered like a foolish to speak that? Like? That's, I think, the you know, legal point of view is absolutely irrelevant what the Supreme Court believes. What yeah. is relevant is what the Supreme Court decided. Yeah. Uh, so they may have decided against their beliefs that still is the yeah. decision that that, yeah. that, that, that is valid that, uh, and not, uh, not their beliefs. Okay. Well, maybe you'd say that the uh, Supreme Court in a legal sense would only be those people um, coming together in a certain setting, but mm -hmm. still you could say um, the meaning of what they say is the type of United States. Yeah. Only when they come okay. So, so yeah, that's that's a very important observation. So, we want most of philosophers, most not everyone, wants to say that the beliefs of the Supreme Court depend on the beliefs of individual members. But maybe this dependence is not just as simple as that. So, so that's what we will be getting to. Yeah, Tomas. Yeah, I do wanted to. Claim that I think I can hear it reading of, of, of the sentence. And part, part of why I think where I'm coming or my intuition is coming from is this dispositionalist intuition, which is to say the Supreme Court believes that abortion stands unconstitutional would be made to you know, make a prediction of future actions of Supreme yeah. Court. Yeah, so that's we will get to the also as well. Yeah. Okay, and the other counter example would be just opposite. Let's get back to Google. Let's say no one in Google believes that open source is good for everyone. They just have a secret meeting <laughs> and decided that, yeah, it would be really wise, PR wise, to invest in open source. We think open source is awful. It <laughs> robs us of our <laughs> hard money, but you know, the world is bad. We have to pretend to be good people. And now we will start to claim that we love open source itself. But then it might be the case that the Google can legitimately claim of itself that it believes that open source is good, even though none of the relevant members of Google believe that. So those sort of examples just aim to show that uh, 
come, the simple summative account is neither necessary nor sufficient condition of attributing uh, beliefs to institutional agents. Yeah. Well, I'm again thinking here, especially also as an individual, perhaps you could, in the legal sense, uh, express your belief, yeah. even though in a cognitive sense you don't actually have that belief. Mm -hmm. And therefore, for legal purposes, maybe beliefs. Yeah, so that's maybe back to metaphor you. So, yeah, so there's a different sense of believing in the legal sense that what you believe in the legal sense is what you pronounce in some special institutional setting, and what you believe in the folk sense is what you have here in your <laughs> head. So, yeah, that, that would be some sort of. But it's still, it's, it's still in its semantics, uh, refers to a certain mental state. Yeah. To the, right. Yeah, yeah. It isn't that just an epistemological problem? For example, we can assume that all um, all the members of the Supreme Court believe that abortion is unconstitutional, unconstitutional, and they still issue a decision in which they find it constitutional or something like that. But that's maybe the analogy to the situation if I say that I believe that there are sharks in the sea at the moment. And I don't really believe that, but well, I still express my belief, and we move out of our like epistemology and and, and tail three my patient yeah. to say that I believe that there are sharks. Okay, so uh, yeah, but does it mean that when the Supreme Court issues a decision that abortion is constitutional, abortion ban is constitutional, does do they lie? <laughs> because I can say uh, I believe that. Uh, Dubrovnik is a beautiful city because Mario is not here yet, but Mario is usually here and he's from Dubrovnik, so I want to, you know, be nice to him because he's my friend and so on, but I really hate it here. <laughs> it was so full of tourists, horrible place. So I, I, I believe that <laughs> Dubrovnik is awful, uh, but I say uh, Dubrovnik is beautiful, so it's straightforward lying, but would it be the same situation with the Supreme yeah, Court? if we ask the same. <laughs> Simple semantic approach that would be the conclusion. Yeah, but maybe it just proves that the theory is bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, Adam? Yeah, it seems to me that a good critique of this kind of thinking, like the semantic account, was actually given at some point by Le Bon, who wrote the book on the psychology of the crowd or whatever it was called. And it was just a passage saying that the decision made by any collective body is more stupid than any member <laughs> of the collective body alone. Okay. Uh, but you're opposing me your also other yeah. direction. I mean, the decision could be uh, wiser than any member of the collective body alone. So that's, okay. that, that's the kind of critique of the company. Yeah. Okay, so uh, we will test this claim now, because I want you to decide collectively whether you want to hear another theory uh, and we probably will need more than 10 minutes to go through it or we want to postpone it to tomorrow. Postpone. <laughs> <laughs> so, so do you accept uh, Professor Stutinsky as your dictator or you want to vote? <laughs> <laughs> we can both provide that, that, that I have 50 votes. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so who's, who's for going for the next theory? Right. <laughs> three three, 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 four. I've watched. <laughs> who's against? Three people, oh, four or five. <laughs> okay. No. Okay, so I have a compromise proposition. I will just <laughs> present the theory, but we will go back to it together and then talk about pros and cons tomorrow. So yeah, so this is the main one of the two main contenders of the market. So this is the Gilbert, Ratman, Tuomela. They are different in detail, but the general approach is similar. So they say something like that. Group intentions align when people act together, but acting together is a special form of action. And there is this work of Margaret Gilbert, the work of Michael Bratman. And what is makes acting together special? Acting together is special because acting together requires special intentions. 
of the members of the group. And those intentions are oriented towards the group. So we act together as summer school when we think of ourselves as being member of a collective and we direct our intentions on the collective, yeah? So in order to act together, it's not enough that we do the same thing. We need to have a special sort of intention to act together, to act as members of the group. And uh, institutional intentions on this account would be reduced to shared or joint intentions of members of those institutions. Uh, so just to finish for today, uh, so for example, this is a very simplified version of Bradman's account. Very, very, very simplified. Bradman has like 400 page one book, so <laughs> I'm putting it on single slide, sorry. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> Bradman account reduced to a single slide is just like shared intentions are intentions to act as a member of a group. So I act as a member of one. So let's say the Department of Philosophy decides to I don't know, uh, continue online teaching. So what does it mean that the Department of Philosophy decided? That? So that the, there was the shared intentions of the members of the department. So what does it mean that there was the shared intention of the members of the department? It was that all or most members of the department had this intention to act as the members of the department. And the, their intention to act as members of the department was uh, accompanied that, by a belief that others faculty members of the department also shared this intention. So we sat together in a room and we thought, yeah, let's decide together on you know, continuing on this continuing uh, online teaching. We thought about it and we said, yeah, we all now decide to do this. And, then the shared intention arises, and then the institutional intention can be reduced to the uh, intention of the shared intention of the member. So this is uh, slightly more complex, and let's talk about the strengths and weaknesses of it tomorrow. And yeah, but this is one of the two main theories to say that institutional intention is just the shared intention, and the shared intention is something which is an individual stuff, but very complex one. Okay, yeah, so I don't know how to stop it and power went away, so I try to do it on my own. Yeah, just stop. I'm stopping, so thanks a lot.